Thank you very much for this opportunity, and that's my pleasure to give this talk today uh, about uh, my approach. I call it an earth from nothing. Uh, of course, if you ask philosophers, they probably argue that it's not possible to have something out of nothing. But uh, today I'm going to discuss how we can have an air curve at least out of nothing and why it's, it's the best way, to my opinion, to, to have uh, the future air curve design. However, I would like to start with a story. Sometimes if, if you are familiar with my talk, I start with a short story and today there is no exemptions. And the story is about uh, two uh, famous guys. One is more famous than the other. The first one is this guy, which I assume everybody knows. So there is no need to, to ask Albert Einstein. If there is anybody who doesn't know this guy, you can ask, but okay. And the second person is this guy's so rather unknown person. Is there anybody who knows this guy? Okay, this guy, is rather unknown German mathematician, Theodor Kaluza, uh, And still you see, I'm not surprised if there are not many who knows it, there are few who knows him in the world, but he did something that uh, Einstein failed to do actually. Uh, but uh, there were some problems that uh, it was not noticed well. However, for me personally, he, he was a great inspiration. Uh, actually, honestly, more than what I'm inspired by Einstein because of something. He showed us that being smart is not enough if we want to move the boundaries. We should be brave as well. I mean, long story short, the whole story is started in 1905, where Einstein introduced his uh, special theory of relativity, where he showed that nothing can go faster than light. However, he got a problem with gravity, because according to Newton theory of gravity, gravity could move faster than the speed of light, actually with infinite speed. For example, assuming that that uh, sun disappears suddenly, it takes us eight minutes to realize it by seeing the light. It takes light eight minutes to come from sun, sun to earth. However, from gravity, uh, according to Newton, we could notice it instantly. So it simply means gravity moves with infinite speed, which is faster than the speed of light. And that was bothering Einstein. To solve the problem, he realized that he has to really figure out the concept of gravity because Newton himself, he confessed that he could formulate it, but he couldn't really understand the concept of gravity. Okay, long story short, in 1915, Einstein introduced his special theory, his general theory of relativity, where he showed that gravity is nothing but curvatures in space and time. So he called it fabric of space time. And he could formulate it by bending space, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, and based on his formulation, he could calculate the speed of gravity. And it was exactly equal to the speed of light. So it was a relief for Einstein. Everything was in order. But that was the moment that Kaluza entered the story. Kaluza was a mathematician, not a physicist. But he was extremely inspired by the work of Einstein. And he thought, how about if we can formulate other forces of nature in the same way by bending something? And if he could do so, actually, he could introduce the theory of everything, one theory that can explain all the forces of nature, something that Einstein spent the rest of his life searching for that with no success. However, in that time, the nuclear forces were not yet discovered. So all they knew was gravity and electromagnetism. So Kaluza thought, what if he can introduce electromagnetism in the same way, by bending something? But he got a problem. Because Einstein left nothing for him to bend. He introduced gravity by bending three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. There is nothing left for Kaluza. That was the moment he showed us we need to be brave if we want to move the boundaries. He put his step out of the box and said, if the forces of nature working in a way of bending something, and if gravity works by bending three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, and there is a still electromagnetism, there must be more dimensions of space. So he said, let's assume space has four dimensions. Very weird and bizarre assumption, but he said, just let's assume it. 
he put aside the work of Einstein and started doing the math from scratch based on the very bizarre and weird assumptions of four dimensions of space, one dimension of time. The output was astonishing. It was exactly Einstein equation of gravity and Maxwell equations of electromagnetism. So he introduced his, his, his theory in 1919, four years after Einstein. However, it did not receive many attention. I mean, everybody was astonished about the outputs, but they said, okay, four dimensions of space? That's, that's bizarre, that's nonsense. Where is the fourth one? Why can't we see this? Why can't we touch it? Okay, Kaluza didn't receive any much, I would say, a, a, a credit for his theory until he passed away. And Einstein spent the rest of his life after that searching for this, this theory of everything, one theory to combine all forces of nature with no success. However, when in 1980s, the Estrin theory was introduced and later in 1995, the M theory, the most advanced version of string theory was introduced, which is known as the best candidate for theory of everything. One theory that can explain all the forces of nature we realized that the, the, the theory is based on no assumptions, but the output of the theory shows that there are indeed more dimensions of space. That was the moment we started acknowledging Kaluza. The poor mathematician told us 100 years ago that the key to the theory of everything is extra dimensions of space. We were not just brave enough to believe. I told this story because I also believe these days, we are in a moment to push the boundaries, make a breakthrough in aviation. However, being smart may not be sufficient. We need to be brave as well. How? I'm going to tell you in the coming minutes. What is the motivation? The motivation is the challenges ahead of us to preserve our environment. We are facing a serious problem with its uh, environmental impact of all the industries, including aviation, and we have goals to reduce these emissions significantly by 2050. For example, we have to, for aerospace, we have the goals of reducing CO2 by 75%, NOx by 90%, noise maybe by 65%. And to give you a feeling about this number, I here compared the latest two versions of Boeing company, 777 and 787. And we know that there is a big jump in the performance of 787 compared to the previous version. So for the first time, we got more than 50% of the aircraft as the composite material, a lot of uh, new technologies, high level of electrification. However, after all, what we got is 12% reduction in uh, fuel consumption, 12% reduction in CO2, and 35% reduction in NOx. And if you compare it with the gold, 75% reduction in CO2, 90% reduction in NOx, you see that with this level of uh, uh, improvement, probably it's hard to get to the target by 2050. How we can fix this problem? The answer is in the history of aviation. If we look into the history of aviation from the Wright Brother flights up to today, we can see two jumps in the performance of civil aviation. These two jumps, we call the S-curve of the, 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 the performance of civil aviation, they were due to introduction of new technologies like fly-by-wire system, jet engines, pressurized cabin, a high bypass ratio turbofan engines. And we know today, if we want to get to the third jump, which was necessary to satisfy the needs for 2050, we need uh, to introduce something different yeah, to get this third jump what to do, we are thinking about different solutions. To get to that, I want to raise a, a questionnaire. Uh, I don't know, Ulrich, is it possible to uh, open a poll and get some feedback from audience? So my question is, what do you think? What is the efficiency of air transportation? Is it between 0 to 20%, 20 to 40%, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80%? Oh, yeah. Is it technically yeah. possible to have a poll? Uh, I, zero to 20, just a second. Oh, it would take some time. Actually, you have the right to do it, but. Um... I cannot write into the window, sorry. Okay, no worries. So 
Okay, I usually ask these questions also in the, in the classes from students and barely I get the right answer. You know, if we want to calculate the efficiency of air transportation, the first thing is to know the meaning of efficiency. Uh, in, in, in physics, a standard definition of efficiency is, the, the, of course, the ratio of output of the system to the input. The input of the system is the total energy we give to the system. And the output, which the standard definition of uh, uh, efficiency uses, is the useful work done by the system. So we want to see how much of this energy is transferred into a useful work by the system. Of course, we can calculate this useful work. Yeah? So the total energy is no. Yeah? It's the amount of fuel we give to the aircraft or for electric aircraft. We can calculate how much energy we give to the aircraft. But how much useful work is done by air transportation? Again, from physics, we know that the useful work done by a system is equal to the change in the potential and kinetic energy of the system. And that one we can calculate. So when we start the air transportation, we start at zero speed. And when we end the trip, we also end at zero speed. So it simply means the change in the kinetic energy of the system is zero. The same goes about the potential energy. So we start at zero altitude and end at zero altitude. Yeah, normal transportation. So ignore the minor change in the uh, altitude of the airport. So it simply means the potential, the change in the potential energy of the system is also zero. Which means the useful work done by the system is zero, which is translated to exactly zero percent efficiency. So it's known that not only air transportation, transportation in general is 0% efficient because we don't do any useful work in transportation. But the question is, why do we need energy for transportation if we don't do any useful work there? Well, the answer is we need the energy because we have to move, at least on this planet, we have to defeat gravity and air resistance to move. So we need energy to, mini, to, to, to fight with gravity and air resistance. Now, considering this fact, how we can get the third jump, we need technologies to minimize weight and threat. If we can do this too, we can minimize the amount of energy we need for transportation and probably uh, uh, the emission as well. What are suggested? There are many suggestions. So some, for example, flow control for drag reduction has been suggested, load alleviation for weight reduction, advanced material and structures for weight reduction. There are many different technologies at the moment uh, being investigated by different uh, uh, research institutes around uh, across the world. And you know, for the C cluster, we are also touching a couple of important ones. That is not all, of course, because we know gravity and drag are forces. So to, to fight with them, we need a mechanism to change this energy into force, which is drag, which is engine of the aircraft. And unfortunately, these propulsion systems are not also 100% efficient. So we also need technologies to improve the efficiency of propulsion systems. So we're thinking about distributed propulsion, better ways of propulsion integration, boundary layer ingestion, or even going to new energy storage and convergence concept like hybrid electric or electric aircraft, hydrogen and fuel cells. Many technologies are, are suggested, which could help us to have the third jump in the history of aviation. However, there would be another question to answer before we can get this third jump. And the question is, how should this airplane look like? Again, if you look at the history of aviation, you see there is not much change in the, the, the appearance of the aircraft. They all look the same from the very early passenger aircraft to today, they all have a tube as a wing, a tube as a fuselage, two wings, a horizontal, two horizontal tails, one vertical tail at the end, a few engines mostly under the wing, sometimes at the end of the fuselage. All we see today is, is more or less this one. However, we know that if we want to get this, this third jump, new technologies are not enough. They should be combined with new configurations for two reasons. One is that some of these technologies do not work even with normal configurations, like boundary layer ingestion, for example. We really need to tightly integrate propulsion and uh, airframe to achieve this, this goal. And some of them, uh, uh, if, if you consider all of them together, you see we still do not 
uh, have the potential to reach the goal, we need to actually take advantage of novel configurations as well. So we put together the advantage of novel configuration and novel uh, technologies together, they might be able to reach the goals by 2050. However, there is another question. Is this really novel configurations that we are talking about? One of the very promising configuration that we are considering for the next generation of passenger aircraft is blended big body. Yeah, you, you see many research ongoing on this configuration. However, if you look into the history, you will see the first flight in 1946. Yeah. Another example is forward swapping, another very promising technology and configuration, many uh, uh, research ongoing today. Again, and first flight 19. 44. So these novel technologies have been around for decades. The reason that we could not realize them was probably that we did not have good technologies to support such disruptive design. Okay, today we have these technologies, so we can realize the dream. However, there is still one challenge to, to, to address before we can combine all these new technologies to the new configuration and make it fly. The challenge is that how to design them, which design methodology we should use. Can we still use the traditional design methodology to combine novel technologies with novel configurations, or we need something new? Well, to discuss it, I, I should quote myself. Uh, I, I know after my PhD at Delft, uh, I got it in 2013, every candidate had to propose 10 propositions as, as an attachment to their, their thesis. And one of the, the propositions I, I wrote, and it's my favorite one, I wrote by assuming something, approximating another thing, and neglecting the rest, engineers were able to put a man on the moon. And it was really the case, because I mean, the, the reason I thought about it when I was undergrad students uh, going to the, the classes, mainly engineering and design classes, I was always believing that something is wrong. The, the professors are fooling us, because all the, the methodologies they are telling us is really by some assumptions, some approximation, and come on, come on, coming up with some engineering uh, method, and they say it works. I was sure that if I get into a higher education level and go to industries, I will see that we will do something completely different to make things fly. However, when I got into higher education and got in touch with industries, I realized that no, this engineering method are really something that took us to moon, and then at these days still taking us to, to, to the air, taking us to the sea, and even going to Mars by that. And if you look into the, 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 all the, the, the engineering method for aircraft design, we see the same approach, assuming something, approximating another thing, neglecting the rest, it gives us some good engineering method that, that works. Yeah. It takes us to the space, to the air, to the sea. However, is this sufficient for the next generation of future aircraft design, or we need to think about something? different. What is the problem here? What you see in this engineering method is that design is defined as an ill-defined problem. Ill-defined problem by definition are the problem which do not have a very specific path toward the solution and not even a unique solution. How we solve it for design, we invented the design cycle. We have three steps in design cycle. One is synthesis. So where we come on coming up with some ideas, how to make things work, what could be a good solution for this design problem based on our experience, knowledge, know-how. And then we go to analysis, we assess this, this uh, uh, possible I mean, suggestion, and then we do decision making, whether this assessment shows that we get what we want or not, we go back, adjust it until we keep doing this iteration until we converge to a solution. Okay, now, Time to be smart, the first step. If we can change design into a well-defined problem. Well-defined problems are problems with specific goals, clear defined solution, and probably clear expected solution. One suggestion for this change from ill-defined into well-defined problem is what we call mathematical optimization. If we can have governing equations, if we can define some mathematical equations, that if we solve them, we get a design, a feasible design. Feasible means a design that satisfies the requirement. Doesn't mean how good, but at least it's accepted. Yeah. 
This governing equations will be a function of three inputs. One, we call it design parameters. It's what we define as a fixed, uh, I would say, requirement for, the, for the, 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 the task to be done. For example, if you want to design an aircraft, the number of passengers you should carry with the aircraft, the range that you, you should fly. These are usually given as a requirement. So these are design parameters. Then we have design variables. Design variables are what we as a designer have the rights and, and the task to define, like the geometry of the aircraft, the dimension of the aircraft. And then we have something called state variables. State variables are the variables that will be determined after solving these governing equations to make it uh, uh, satisfy. For example, the weight of the aircraft. If you have the, the design parameters, if you have the design variables, if you solve the governing equations, you should get the weight of this. And we have different ways to solve these governing equations. Yeah. Assume we have a way to define them. Now, this is another question I will discuss, how, how to define these governing equations. But if you can define a set of equations, mathematical equations, that if you solve them, you get a feasible design. Then how you do it, you give parameters and variables to that. You solve it using any method. Here I showed, for example, Newton method. It can be any method. You get the state variables, which means a feasible design. What would be the next step? Okay, still there is a question how to define these design variables, x, the vector x. We still should come from the designer. The next step is that we define another loop around this feasibility loop. We call it optimality. There are mathematical algorithms that based on the output they get from this feasibility loop, they can define the new inputs for that. And these new inputs steer the design not only toward a feasible solution, but also toward an, opt an optimal solution. So if you use optimality loop to determine design variable, the output of these two loops working together will be not only a feasible solution, but an optimum solution. Now the question is, which feasibility, which governing equations you need? For aircraft design, we have different disciplines. Minimum, you need aerodynamic, structure, performance, propulsion. So you have multidisciplinary optimization problem. Governing equations based on different disciplines, how you model them, you have to look. So you have, for example, uh, flow physics, you define the governing equations of aerodynamics, navier stokes equation, you define it for flow, you have the, the structure uh, uh, mechanics to, to, to define the solid mechanics to define the governing equations of a structure, multi-body dynamics to define the dynamic of aircraft. There are different ways to come up with a, a mathematical model of the, the, the design problem. And if you solve them together, you might be able to get the feasible and optimal. This MDO approach, multidisciplinary design optimization approach, it can answer some open questions that cannot be answered without this. For one example that I usually show is the, the low boom supersonic design. You know, it was one of the main problem of Concord. Supersonic was a great masterpiece of engineering, but one thing that limited this operation was the sonic boom. That it, it forbidden, for example, the aircraft to fly over land in many countries. Now with the use of MDO, we can design a supersonic aircraft with minimum impact of, of the sonic boom. And I, I can hardly imagine this type of design could be feasible, at least in a good way or, 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 or a realistic time and effort without the use of this, this uh, MDO loop. Okay, before I go to the next step, I just want to look what is my current state of work on MDO for aircraft design to show how we can have an aircraft from nothing. This is the first step. One thing that we are uh, hardly working on that, me and my team, is to develop a digital design framework based on multidisciplinary design optimization. I call it a demo, aircraft design engine based on multidisciplinary analysis and design optimization, to start the design from scratch, clean sheet, and refine it at the end with high fidelity MDO. So this, this framework, it's, it's the backbone of our also our C cluster, is four layer of design, so some people call it multi-fidelity. I, I would much prefer to call it multi-layer because the difference in different layers is not just the fidelity that can work tightly together and concurrently. So the first layer, I call it design initiator, is where you start the design from scratch. Still manual design, yeah? it's not an aircraft from nothing. You have to come up with a solution 
uh, uh, for your design, how your aircraft should look like, how the, 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 the different technologies should be combined. And of course, you need some tools to support it. And we are, my and my team, uh, extensively working together with the Stanford University to develop this SWAV toolbox. It's an open source aircraft design toolbox that is also used as the main tool for this, this first step. We developed our own design initiator to come up with an, an initial aircraft and then couple it with its software for uh, uh, design and optimization at the conceptual level. Lower fidelity, but considering as, as many as possible uh, uh, aspects of design. The second layer I call the technology integrator, where we have surrogate modeling to combine the output of different disciplinary analyses we are some, some low fidelity surrogate model, but tightly integrated with the, the uh, conceptual aircraft design. The second, the third layer is a physics based design where we use uh, more higher fidelity analysis, physics based, but not at the highest possible fidelity because we want to increase the, the dimension of the design. We want to still have a wide range of disciplines and components but getting away from non-physics space or empirical methods. Here, for example, the backbone is FEMBAT tool, is, is uh, our in-house tool I developed in my time at Delft, and here is to uh, do coupled adjoint aerostructural optimization of uh, aircraft, including wider range of disciplines and uh, uh, components. And of course, the last one is very high fidelity, I mean, the highest fidelity that we can afford at the moment, uh, uh, optimization, uh, uh, but for limited number of disciplines and components. And of course, they all are coupled tightly together, working together nicely. And as an example, I can show you the work of my PhD, Stanislav Karpuk, on this cluster of excellent, sustainable, and energy efficient aviation, where we use this ADEMAO framework to come up with uh, two different designs so far one mid range aircraft, hybrid electric, and one short range aircraft, full electric. Uh, including all these novel technologies that I mentioned. So the ADEMA works with clean sheet design, so coming up with the ideas, basic geometry modeling, go to surrogate modeling, FEMBET for aerostructural optimization, and then high fidelity uh, refinement coming up with a final design. Another example I would like to show is a European project I'm coordinating with five other uh, uh, university and research centers in Europe and realizing ultra high, aspect, uh, high bike, uh, ultra high aspect ratio wind on different configuration like a strut bracing and twin fuselage and you see here the outcome of the work of my phd ian ma using again at the mao framework multi-layer digital design uh, environment to come up with this solution yeah. so tights the coupled uh, multidisciplinary and optimization with uh, uh, aircraft conceptual design for full digital design of future aircraft with new technologies, new configuration. However, what should be the next step? What does it mean an aircraft from nothing? Let's have a look which kind of aircraft design tool we can have. The first thing that is frequently used in industry is, is a derivative design. When they have an aircraft based on aircraft, and they want to improve it, for example, from A320 to A320neo, from doing 737 to 737 max. Yeah. The based on aircraft is the same. The modifications are minor, changing the engines, a little bit modification of the, for example, uh, component being fuselage, but it will not be a new design. Yeah. And for this derivative design, there are many tools that industries are using to do this design. The second uh, level, I call it type B design, is a configuration fixed new design, like the 797 design of Boeing. It will be a new design, however, with the fixed configuration. We know what it should look like, tube and wing, two engines under the wing, tail, however, a new design uh, from a scratch. A type C design, well, I, I call it configuration free new design. A new design from a scratch, but with the freedom of choosing configuration. How should it look like? We are free, you know, like what we did in, in C-Cluster, something which does not look like exactly as the previous aircraft. However, there are other, I mean, this is my uh, uh, definition of aircraft design. So somebody might come with a different definition. I call a type D design oops, as an open new idea, like what we have in the urban air mobility sector, EV talks. You can literally think about anything. Yeah, it's not limited. It's 
completely open. It can be an aircraft, it can be a helicopter, it can be something combined, it can be anything. It's a very wide range of design space. It's not any more configuration change in aircraft design, it's also changing concept of flying. Yeah, so you can use anything you want. Of course, there is something else. I call it type E, which at the moment is kind of science fiction. Yeah. I think a tool which can also develop new technologies for us. So whatever we saw up, up to now, up to type D, the technologies are defined. And so you say, okay, these are the technologies, use it, design an aircraft. But if there is such a smart or artificially intelligent tool, which can also develop new technologies for us and say, okay, these are the new technologies I developed together with the new aircraft configuration. So I designed something new and concept for you to fly. Still, I mean, a border of science fiction, but maybe one day we can have. However, what is the discussion today? At least in the transport aircraft, not EVTOL sector, uh, we are searching for a type C design, a configuration free new design, something that we can come up of uh, uh, a wide range of but limited uh, choices of configuration, start from a scratch to the design, integrate all the new technologies and see if we can satisfy the requirement of goal. However, how to choose this configuration? This is the figure, it's my favorite figure, a figure from an article published by Stanford University in 2012. They used probability theory to generate different configurations based on a few seeded ones. So the green ones, you see they are seeded configuration and the blue one are simply automatically generated by this a rather simple probability theory method, you can see enormous number of different configuration can be generated from combination of this, this seeded one. It's not only for aircraft, they did it for many different things. You can do it for anything, literally, it's just a configuration design. Uh, so I, I remember from the article, they applied it to a, a simple chair, a, a sheet, a, some creature, or whatsoever, yeah? so you can do it. But for aircraft, you can see such a wide range of possibilities. So the question is, which one is really the optimum? Yeah. So far, the choice of configuration has been simply a choice of human driven task, choice of designers. So designers based on their knowledge, experience, creativity, they come up with a solution, a design, a configuration. Each of them has his own pros and cons. Which one is the best, we don't know. Uh, so even if it's possible to compare all the suggested configuration to each other and find the best one, it still doesn't mean that there is no better configuration that works uh, 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 the best. Yeah. So to solve this problem, we have to be brave. This is the, 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 the reason I discussed about smartness and bravery. So the question is, is there an optimum configuration that we can find? So in other words, the problem is that assume we are given amount of payload. So we say we want to transport this amount of payload over this amount of range with this available technology. What should the flying vehicle look like to minimize the energy consumption? How to answer this question? Let's ask another question before we discuss this one. Look at these two configurations. This is a very typical airfoil. So if you are not familiar with aerospace engineering, this is the simple cross section of the beam of an aircraft. If you cut the beam, you will see something like this during the flight, but you will see something like this during takeoff and landing. If, if, you, if you notice when you fly with an aircraft, you will see the beam changes its, its configuration. Something will come out of, of the beam. So the question is, is there any MDO, state-of-the-art MDO, multidisciplinary design optimization technique, which can start from this configuration and end in this configuration? As far as I know, no. Let's go one step higher. Look at the wing of the aircraft. This is a 3D wing of an aircraft, and this is what you see in space planes or some missile, still as a wing, but completely different configuration. Again, is there any methodologies to start this one and end here? No, unfortunately not. Go one step higher to the whole aircraft. You have this configuration and that one. Is the state-of-the-art multidisciplinary design optimization capable of starting from this configuration and end here? No, it's not. What's the reason? The reason is here. They are different in topology. 
The difference is topology is the problem that we cannot simply go from one to the other. Because if you want to do so, you have to optimize the topology of your structure or of your object. Well, topology optimization is nothing new in engineering. The structural topology optimization is, is uh, already a few decades on the desk, and that is a very active, ongoing research topic, well established, but still a lot of uh, uh, space for progress. And you can see easily how many publications every year are going on this topic. However, on the other hand, aerodynamic topology optimization is rather new, limited, to specific cases, low speed, internal flow, not well established yet, attractive uh, enough, but not fully developed. And now I want to talk about multidisciplinary topology optimization. If you want to change the aircraft topology, it's not only aerodynamics, not only structure, you have to combine different disciplines to each other and optimize the topology all at once. Now, it's, it's not existing or well established in literature. How to proceed? Okay, let's see where I'm standing at the moment. We are working a lot on topology optimization in my chair. One example, what I usually use to, to, to show the advantage of topology optimization over normal MDO is the non-intuitive solutions. So this is the masterpiece of my son, two and a half year old son. One day he came with me to my office and next day I found his masterpiece on my closet. I had no idea when he managed to do that. However, a few weeks later, my PhD, he was working on concurrent topology optimization of stringers and fiber pattern optimization in tow steel composite panels. He showed me his founding. And this, what you see here is the optimized uh, fiber patterns in composite and optimum topology of the stringer in a very complex shape. I mean, the first thing came to my mind is that, okay, he simply followed out my son to show something to show me. But later, surprisingly, his work was published in a very good journal. So now I'm thinking probably differently. However, it simply shows no way to intuitively or based on experience, you can simply pick up a pen. I mean, my son can do it, but I cannot. So we can find some, some nice people to do it and get something that is optimal. And of course, you can see this figure from Airbus. This is an artistic figure. It's not a real uh, engineering design. but. The idea is that for bionic structure, maybe the future of aircraft structure is something, we call it bionic structure, non-intuitive. Yeah, something that does not look like what we see today. And it's not something that we can come up with a guess initially based on our knowledge and experience. It really needs to dig into topology optimization, which can open an unexplored area for us. Another example is multi-physics topology optimization, something that's also my uh, other PhD is working on that. One very good example is a heat exchanger. For example, my PhD, Ali Fassemi, worked on topology optimization of micro, uh, heat exchangers for microelectronic applications, something you use for CPUs, for example, in the computer. You can see that is the typical uh, topology of pin fin uh, 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 heat exchangers. And the idea is that how should these fins look like to maximize the heat transfer and at the same time minimize the, the, the pressure loss to minimize the power you need for that. And you can see the methodology he developed and you can see the, the, the work of topology optimization. You start with this uh, uh, circle, but the topology optimization can go to something completely unintuitive, unexpected, give us something totally different, which can be proved to, to I mean, optimum, we cannot mathematically search at the moment to, to prove it, but at least it's very better than this one. So optimized one, yeah, much more improved, which again, not intuitive. It's not something that you can simply uh, make the sketch and ask MDO to optimize the shape for you. What is the next step? Multidisciplinary topology optimization for aircraft design. If we can come up with a methodology that can define all these governing equations we need for design of an aircraft, couple it with very advanced topology optimization approach, we can do so. We have assuming a control volume somewhere that the flow comes in and gets out. And for, to, to the optimizer, we tell, make some object here for us, which can carry that amount of payload over that amount of range with minimum energy consumption. 
and make sure all the governing equations are satisfied. Yeah, so the structural integrity, the required cover for that, the uh, aerodynamic best aerodynamic performance. If we can do so, we will have something out of nothing. There is nothing here. And as I showed you, topology optimization can be something completely unintuitive. The outcome can be, I mean, something similar to what we thought already, but it can also be something completely surprising, yeah, a surprised configuration. Where I'm standing now, the very uh, interesting work of Ali Qasem, it's, it's very recent uh, results. We're gonna publish the details, but I just want to share the excitement with you. Here is an empty control volume and the flow is coming. We developed something very complex, I mean, a few years work, but we tell it, define an object for us, which should have this amount of mini uh, volume there, which should have the best aerodynamic performance, highest lift over drag ratio. Yeah. Still not fully coupled with all the different disciplines, but let's see what the optimizer is trying to do. Starting from nothing, creating something. Of course, it's, it's not an animation. Yeah, it's a real uh, high fidelity physics-based simulation coupled with topology optimization, and it's making an, an object for us. A flying object, which can satisfy the required volume to put something there, but with the best so far aerodynamic performance. Of course, it's for a very low speed flow. Yeah, very low speed flow. Still not, not going to high speed, but I'm sure at least those who have experience in aerospace engineering, it does not look like of any things that we thought so far by ourselves. And if you ask, if you're asked, make something which has the highest lift over drag, the best aerodynamic performance with this volume, we can come up with something like this. This is literally out of nothing. I mean, I can call it an aircraft out of nothing. It's something at least out of nothing, uh, but we're getting closer to an aircraft. Yeah, so we still need to have uh, engine propulsion, some, some place for passenger. You see what you get out of it. Yeah. So we have something out of nothing. We are going to work to make it an aircraft out of nothing. Still a, a way to go, but very honest, uh, this, this idea, I introduced this idea in my uh, inauguration speech. If some of you remember three years ago when I started at Braunschweig, I personally didn't expect that we go so fast. So in three years, we have something out of nothing. I'm, I'm very happy with, with uh, the excellent researcher supporting me in the team. And I hope in uh, uh, rather now I can say near future, we can have an aircraft coming uh, literally out of nothing. And I, I, I want to share the excitement of this surprise configuration with you as soon as uh, I have it. Thank you for the attention. And I have to appreciate the work of my team uh, because that was certainly a work of the whole uh, a chair of aircraft design that I'm leading at uh, Branch Wives. So I can name them uh, Ali Rasemi, Stanislav Karpul, Florian Schoner, Valerio Mosca, Ian Ma, Dr. Daigo Mariama, Dr. Chenzen Liu, uh, Frederick Schiove, Dr. Morteza Abu Hamze, Nicholas Wahler, and the three already alumni of us, Max Puzer, Dr. Yolan Liu, Mohit Talele. And I have to welcome two new members. They will start next week uh, to support this, this hunt for the best aircraft configuration, Anjali Valani and Radimir uh, Yanev. Thank you very much for the attention.